Let's take a look here at Revelation chapter 19. This is a text that all of the Bible builds to. It has been called the second coming of Jesus Christ. It has been called the great getting up morning. It has been called judgment day. Uh, the New Testament simply says it's when the mystery of God is finished. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, you will have all your questions answered. When we look upon our God, it has been said that there are eight great convulsive acts in the Bible. By that meaning that once they happen, life is never the same. The creation, once it was there, it would never be altered. The fall of man, sin went out into the world. It would never, ever be altered until he returns. Uh, then you have the Noahic flood the present world we live in is a testimony to the Noahic flood. And after the Noahic flood, Noah was given government. Whoever sheds man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. He was brought and sacrificed after the ark, and so there was true religion and true government. And that got fourthly commandeered at the Tower of Babel. False religion and false government. The world now. And then shortly after that, you have the setting aside of the Jewish nation, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses and the law, the theocracy of Israel, then the monarchy to govern them. So in the middle of Babylon, you have this nation of God with its Judeo, its revealed worldview that no one else has. And then there is the coming of the king, much attested to and prophesied, and he is crucified. And God now enters into humanity. He becomes one of us to show us who God is. He is our prophet. To die for our sins, he is our priest. And to rule over us, he is our king. And so there is the incarnation of God and his death. And now the truth that was the truth of Israel is carried to the Gentile world in what is called the Western worldview or true civilization, for better or for worse. And it goes out now. And uh, the next event upon his rejection is the second coming and his establishment of the kingdom of God. And as we will see after that, there will be new heavens and new earth. And so those are the eight climactic convulsive acts. They're tsunamis. The earth moves and it's never the same. And all the Bible is the tale of moving around those events that are progressive. And so... Here we take a look at. We have built up to it. The tribulation has lowered the mountains down and raised up the ravines. Mankind is humbled. He is leveled. And it is ready as a carpet for the king. And so heaven in verse 1 comes to its feet. After these things, the judgment of Babylon, religion and state, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. Heaven comes to its feet. You know, one of the problems in teaching this text, it's like trying to play uh, Beethoven with a pair of spoons, you know. You're, you see the music and it's majestic, but this is the best you got. The best you have is just correlative ideas, analogous ideas. We can never do justice to this text. So I'm just waiting until it happens, and I'm going to be there in glory next to you, and I'm going to be saying, I told you. There it is, but we can't do it justice. And so here is a great multitude coming to its feet in heaven. And they are coming to their feet because it's time. Acts 1.8, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? It's not for you to know the time that's fixed by the Father's authority. Here it is. It is time. Ask of me, Psalm 2, and I will give you the, the, uh, the earth as thine inheritance, and you'll rule it with a rod of iron. Strike it as with earthenware. And so now the, the son says to the father, I want it now. And so the earth is about to go over to him. We're going to see the redemption of planet earth, the reconquest of heaven, of God's creation. Uh, since Eden, the world has been lost. 
to God, and now it is about to be reclaimed. Someone is coming. In verse 1, you're going to see four of these hallelujahs. It's called the hallelujah chorus. Hallel is the only Hebrew word we have in the New Testament. We have some Aramaic words. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Talithakum, little girl, arise. Things like this. But Hebrew, Hallel means praise. Yahweh is the covenant name of God that is given in uh, Genesis 2 verse 4. The name that God relates to man, that relates to Israel, as, as he discloses who he is, the God of the Bible of Israel, the true God, the creator of man. And so we take that initial name, Yahweh, and now he establishes his kingdom, Hallelujah. It's like we connect the beginning and the end of the Bible, the old creation and the new creation. It's amazing. And so, praise to Yahweh. And here is why. Because his judgments are true and righteous. God is glorified for putting an end to Babylon, the pretender, the wicked witch is dead. And, in verse 2, because he has judged the great harlot who did what? Corrupted the earth with her immorality, and he avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. Uh, when it says salvation and glory and power belong to our God, the salvation spoken of, I don't think, and others don't think, it's a spiritual salvation. It's salvation in the sense of deliverance. Has there always been a sense on our planet of trying to get rid of of heartache, evil, and the curse. We've tried it scientifically, philosophically, psychologically, through education, through science, through the arts, some way, through drugs. We're waiting on an alien. If he'll just show up, he can fix it. All right? We're all, we, we look to politics in some way to fix this thing that has been broken. Hallelujah, because salvation belongs to our God. Only God can fix it. His power to his glory. We say this in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. It's your glory. And so God, with no other way to remedy the planet, God has fixed it. And this is also true spiritually. Is there any way to make man new? To give him a rebirth and to make him born of God? We're always trying to find some solution to this. The latest has been if we could just take the evil gene in him and centrifuge it out that we would just have this, I guess, look like slime or tar or something, that we would centrifuge out of man and just remove the evil from him. If we could just give him a lobotomy and fix him. Salvation belongs to our God. That's why I was excited about becoming a Christian. I had always, as a little kid, had a sense of, of I, I had a sense of purpose and a sense of destiny, but I didn't know what it was. And so I, I would, would tend to uh, succeed in the wrong things until I came to Christ. And then I saw my roommate come to Christ. And then another guy on the team come to Christ. And then our trainer come to Christ. Remember Doc Wilson at Louisville? He came to Christ. And I saw men made new. And one of them was the most wicked individual in the history of football. He was a, he played secondary, and he was from San Antonio. He was wicked, all right? And he came to Christ, and everybody on the team stood up and took notice. And his coach, Bill Brazier, came up to me one time, and he said, boy, what happened to him is amazing. I said, yeah. He said, I mean, it's like, it's like he's not even the same person. I said, that's right. I said, that's why we do all this stuff, 
is because we really do see a final solution. And so when I saw people saved, I said, this is worth failing at. This is worth dying for. Uh, if I had to come to become a Christian, maybe I'd have tried to have been uh, Che Guevara or something. Maybe I'd have tried to do it through communism or something, try to fix man. But we just couldn't find a way to fix him. This is the only way to fix him because it deals with the most fundamental thing, and that is the detachment of man to the Almighty. And so, hallelujah, deliverance, glory, and power belong to our God because he has judged the great harlot, Babylon. She's deceiving, and then she's corrupting, and then she kills God's bondservants, just like the devil. I'll tempt you, I'll ruin you, and then I will cut off from you the antidote. Is that diabolical or what? I will deceive you. I will curse you. I will ruin you. And then I will make you hate the only solution there is. And that is Jesus Christ. I'll kill those people before I'll let them speak. In verse 3, a second hallelujah. Her smoke rises forever. There's not going to be a comeback of evil. This destruction of theology, philosophy, psychology, um, ideology, and then what governs man that emits from it, the world system, it is never going to rise again. The smoke will rise forever. And in verse 4, the 24 elders... The church in glory, if you've been here through our whole study. And the four living creatures from the throne of God, they fell down and they worshiped God, saying, amen, hallelujah. And then a voice came from the throne saying, and this, I think, is given as a privilege to the church in glory to say this because this was their purpose all during their time. Give praise to our God, all you his bondservants, you who fear him, small and great. All of the faithful of God in heaven and on earth are cause, called to confess the Lamb and to bow before him. And in verse 6, something like a voice of a great multitude, the sound of many waters. It's like a flood. What is a flood? You ever been to Niagara Falls? It's deafening. What does a flood take away? Everything. Every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess. We're going to clear the deck. God whistles and says, everybody out of the pool. We're clearing the deck. And so, verse 6, the final of the four hallelujahs. Hallelujah, the Lord, our God, the Almighty. It takes the three great names of God and even though they're in Greek, it would be Yahweh, the Greek will put it as Adonai, our God, the Old Testament would say our El, here our Theos, the Almighty, the Old Testament would say El Shaddai, it takes the covenantal names of God, God, Lord, the Almighty, and he reigns. What verb tense are we in? Reigns. What is that? Present. The reclaiming of planet Earth has begun. The heavens are about to open, and something that man has never seen is about to occur. A new king is coming, and in verse 7, he's bringing somebody with him. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, meaning it's party time. And his bride has made herself ready, and it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen. A divine enablement for this bride to put on fine linen, bright and clean. And the fine linen is, the Greek says, the righteousness says of the saints. What is this bride? What is this fine linen? And what is this feast? 
The bride is you and it's me. The one that God has taken to share his life and all of his wealth is now hers. Uh, Where did she first occur? Well, look back at Revelation chapter 4, just really quick. I want you to see it. In Revelation 4, the, the rapture took place. And verse 1, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven and the first voice, like the sound of a trumpet, said, come up here and I'll show you what must take place after these things. Chapter 3 and 4, the church age. I'm sorry, 2 and 3, the church age. What must take place after these things? John, spoken to as the typical token Christian, come up here. And immediately in verse 2, he is in the presence of God. And he sees someone in verse 4 standing around the throne or sitting around the throne because they're close to God. 24 thrones. I shared with you before that the number 24 in the Old Testament is the number of the priesthood. There were 24 orders of priests. These are priests that sit in the presence of God. And they are upon thrones. They're priests and kings. They're going to rule with him. And I saw 24 elders. An elder is a representation of a greater multitude. So it's not just 24 men. It is 24 that represent an innumerable host. In other words, God sees you. When our elder board comes together, in a spiritual sense, all of the body is there. And so in verse 4, they are sitting because their work is finished. They're laboring all of their life, and now it's finished. And they are clothed in, what's it say? White garments. See also chapter 19, white garments, bright and clean with golden crowns because they have endured till the end and they have been crowned. They have finished the race. Question, who are these people? It is the raptured church. You don't see them for the rest of Revelation. All you saw was the tribulation. The focus of God is the nation of Israel, the 144,000, and Gentile believers during the tribulation that are brought to faith. Where are we? We're in glory. Amen? We're in glory. When do we appear again? I'm glad you asked. (laughs) Revelation 19. There we are again. Verse 7. The marriage of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready in fine linen, bright and clean. You're meant to connect. Verse 8 to chapter 4, verse 4. This is us. Chapter 4, we left. Chapter 19, we're coming back. Yeah. Do I believe in a pre-tribulational rapture? Yes. Let's keep going. And so she's clothed in fine linen, bright and clean. Incidentally, you know who else we're called here? In chapter, uh, uh, well, in, in chapter 19 and verse 14, look over at that. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That's the bride, but it doesn't call us the bride in verse 14. What's it call us? The armies. We're going to not see the second coming, we're going to be the second coming. The book of Zechariah says he will come with many of his holy ones. That's you. We're coming with him. Because what is true of Jesus is true of us. We are joint heirs with Christ, Romans 8. And what is true of him is true of us. Does the firstborn, Christ, does he get to rule? We get to rule with him. That's amazing. I was in Memphis last week and uh, was visiting with a fella. And I said, hey, you got an Elvis story? He said, oh, do I have an Elvis story? 
He said, uh, I was in Adrian Rogers Church, Bellevue Baptist, for a long time in Memphis. And he said, I met a couple of guys named, their last name was Stanley. And he said, their mother had been abandoned by their father. And they had been put in a, in a boy's home to be taken care of. And then one day, they said there were three of the Stanley boys. And one day they came to him and said, y'all get up, gather your things. You're going to a new home. Your mama just got remarried. And so they went outside to wait for this guy. And it was a black limousine picked him up. And it took them to a house that was the land of grace. Graceland. They said, what are we doing pulling up at this holy site? And turned out the guy that Stanley's mother had married was Vernon Presley. And he had a particular son uh, who happened to be the king. Elvis. And they said, we pulled up and there the doors opened and we looked upon him. in all of his glory and he came out and he said uh, y'all are my little brothers and whatever I've got you've got to this is my daddy he's your daddy this is my house it's your house and the next morning when they got out of bed one of the Stanley boys said there was out in front of the house Elvis said come on out here I want to show you something and here was three ponies and three bicycles and three go-karts because what is true of me is true of you. Isn't that good? Why couldn't you say, but thank you very much. <laughs> what is true of him is true of you. You say, that's unbelievable. It is barely believable that God could take us from the outhouse to the penthouse and that's what he's done and so in uh, verse uh, 7 and 8 the bride is us what is the fine linen huh bright and clean the verse 8 says it's the righteousness as of the saints isn't that a strange word that's why most of the times it'll translate it the righteous deeds. Question, what is the only thing that survives the, uh, the old world? It is the memory of what we did for Christ. Can you take it with you? Depends what you're asking about. Jesus lost everything he lost ahead of his death. But did he take something with him? He said... Uh, Surely, I say to you, you'll be with me in paradise. He took a soul. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. And if I go away, I'll come again and I'll receive you to myself. So can you take some things with you? You can take the righteous deeds of the saints. Now, let me tell you what this is. Where have our righteous deeds, all that we have done, where has it been unveiled? If I were to ask you what you knew about the B-E-M-A, the Bema, would that be new to you? It's the most untaught area of Christology. It's called the Bema. And it means the judgment seat of Christ. Question, will you and I be judged for our sins? Say no. No, and do like this. <laughs> we're glad. We're glad we will not be judged for our sins. Will we be judged? Yes, we will. That's why Paul said, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. He said, you better get ready. Uh, we won't be judged for our sin, but we will be done, and I quote, for the deeds which we did in the body. I gave you X amount of time. I gifted you with this. I placed you here with these providential things around you. And now... What did you do? 
and the time that I gave you. And so we will be judged. It's called the Bema because it's a term that comes out of Greece. In Greece, that was kind of the father of track and field. They had the Athenian games and they had the Isthmian games uh, around Corinth. And that's why two of your great texts on the Bema are written to the Corinthians. They knew what this meant. Was that a church also that needed some exhortations about standing before God? And so what you would do is when you would compete in the games, before you did, you had to take a vow. I will not drink. I will not gluttony. I will train. I will not go into women. I will not do these things. They had to know that when you were going to compete in the games, we had to have the best. What we have now is, you know, the Sweet 16, the, the Final 8, Final 4, you, you work through them. But in those days, you didn't have round robins. You just competed. And so you had to swear that I would do this. And so you would run. And then after you ran, there had to be accountability. You stood before the judge, the civil judge. It was called the Bema. And he would say, did you do any of these things? Swear to the gods that you did not do them. I did not do them then we bestow upon you the reward. And if you did, you were disqualified. You took the second place. We had a kid in our church that had a gold medal from the Sydney Games in wrestling. He had previously won a silver, but the guy that beat him was disqualified because of the Bema, otherwise known as a blood test. You had performance enhancing drugs. You broke the rules. Who was the greatest, arguably the greatest pitcher that's ever lived? Uh, Roger Clemens. Is he going to get into the Hall of Fame? It's going to be tough. He broke the rules. He had performance enhancing drugs. Greatest home run hitter of all time, Barry Bonds. Is he in the Hall of Fame? He broke the rules. Performance enhancing drugs. Who's the best overall hitter? Ty Cobb, 4,000 something. Uh, will he get in the Hall of Fame? You can't bet on baseball. And he did, and he wouldn't apologize. He broke the rules. Matter of fact, there was a guy, second service, we got all kind of time. We can just, you know. <laughs> Anybody ever heard of a guy named Juan Marichal? If you were my age, you remember Juan Marichal for the San Francisco Giants. He was batting one time back when pitchers had to bat. And he got mad at Johnny Roseborough, the catcher for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Fights happen all the time in baseball. But there's one thing you can't do. You can't take a bat to a fight. It's an unspoken rule. And he took his bat and hit Roseboro twice, which is, you can't do. It's verboten. He never apologized. He didn't get in the Hall of Fame. He broke the rules until he apologized, and the next year he got in. That'll learn him. And that's the way rules are. So it's interesting that the best home run hitter, the best pitcher, and the best overall hitter in the history of the game will not get into the Hall of Fame because they broke the rules. You can't do that. Well, that's the Bema. You and I will face the Bema. It's not going to be for salvation. It's going to be for our deeds, which we did. Jesus put it like this. When you pray, don't stand praying like the Gentiles to be heard for their many words, for they have their reward in full. Everybody clapped. You wanted men's applause and you got it. Now, go into your closet and there talk to your father who's in secret and your father who is in secret will reward you. When you fast, don't make a scene. Do it where your father who sees in secret and he'll reward you. When you, what? When you give, don't make a scene. Don't let your right hand know what you're left to do and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And so you can speak with the tongues of men and angels, but you don't have love. You're a noisy gong. You can know all mysteries and all knowledge. You don't have love. 
You're nothing. I can give my body to be burned and by faith move mountains. If I have not love, it profits me nothing. God doesn't look at just what you do. He looks at why you did what you do. Did you do it for the glory of God? Or did you do it for you? Then it is burned. You got your applause. You got the eyes of men. It's what you did for me. Uh, Dwight Pentecost used to teach at Dallas Seminary. And he would say at the beginning of the year, he said he would have a bunch of firewood. And he said by the end of the year, he would burn it all. And all the firewood had come down to ash in his uh, fireplace. And he would shovel it up, take it out, and throw it out as fertilizer for the rose bushes. And all that he had had been reduced to nothing. And he said, that's the Bema. And so, am I going to get rewarded because I'm a preacher? Not necessarily. Why did you preach? Because I loved the Lord, I loved his word, and I wanted to see people grow. Well done. Or you wanted to show off your fancy wardrobe. Okay. <laughs> Which is hard to escape. <laughs> you want to show off your flowing hair? Huh? Is that what you're trying to Well, you got your reward, and so that's all. So can you be a preacher and get rewarded? Not necessarily. Can you be a plumber and be overlooked? Nope. Did you do what you did for the glory of God? Like the sign you see of an, an over sinks at houses, services performed here three times daily, that you did it for the glory of God. And so... This is mentioned in 2 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 3, Romans 14, Ephesians 6, Philippians 4, 3 John 8, 1 Corinthians 9. There's three parables about it. The Sermon on the Mount, chapter 6, is about it. It's a big deal of Scripture. I'm going to stand before God, and he will take what I've done. Is it weighty for the glory of God, or is it just dust that was done for men? And that is your reward. The righteous deeds of the saints are final and then. You know what I think it is? If a man, if I buy broadcloth or Oxford cloth, it's a nice shirt. You got to iron it. It's cotton. If you buy 40 pinpoint Oxford, that's another thing. That's a $110 shirt. Because it's, the weave is so close. There's so much cloth to it. 80 pinpoint Oxford. Uh, You've got to get it dry cleaned and pressed. A 110 point pinpoint Oxford uh, will take a bullet. It's like Kevlar. You can shoot you and it won't get through. <laughs> Just kidding. But that's a 110 point. It's about a $175 shirt. And it glows. It shines. And so everything that you did and I do will become our garment. Dr. Pentecost used to say there will be 60 watt Christians and 110 watt Christians and there will be 400 watt Christians. It is just and so there will be an acknowledgement. Uh, let me show you something. Go back to your left to 1 Corinthians 3 I want to spend just a little time on this because there is so much just ignorance. Not that we know wrongly, but we don't know at all. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul was talking about teachers. And he said in verse 10, according to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a, the Greek word is architect, a master builder, I laid a foundation, Christ. Paul was the evangelist to Corinth. And then another teacher has come and he's building upon it. Paul would teach, he would leave, and other guys would come in. But he says in verse 10, each man must be, what's your Bible have? Careful when you build upon the foundation of Christ. You be careful what you're building with. And verse 11, no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You can't see anybody saved by philosophy, mere education, psychology, 
religion, science. It is the revelation of God of his son. The word of God from the outside is what saves us. Amen? There's nothing out there that is salvific. Only what has come down to us in Christ and his word. And so you be careful as a pastor, as a teacher, when you start building on the very word of God. Because in verse 12, if any man builds on the, and notice 11, any man, 12, any man who builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, straw, you can build with things that are, for the practical purpose, eternal. They will never wear out. Or you can build with wood, hay, and straw. Now, this again is spoken to the teacher. Be careful how you build on it. The great many of you were led to Christ some other place in the country, and you're here now. I get to build upon you. I need to be careful. Because the thing we all have in common is the grace of God through his word of Jesus Christ. Amen? I need to be careful what I'm building on that. If I want to merely teach y'all human ideas and philosophy and if I want to do just a monologue up here and talk to you about moral ideas, you better be careful because in verse 13, each man's work will become, what's the word? Evidence. We're going to have evidence We're going to look at what you did because the day we're going to turn the light on, it'll show it. It's to be revealed with, what's the word? Fire. We're going to set fire to it. This is the Bema. And let's see what endured that you taught them. Did you teach them Genesis, Exodus? Did you teach them the Song of Solomon? Yes, and only I. Oh, God. I taught them Revelation. And I, did you teach just for the numbers that you got? I tried not to. Did you teach because, did you try to have clarity? Did you back off when you got down to issues that the culture didn't agree with? Tried not to. Well, we're going to find out because it is to be revealed with fire and the fire will test the kind of each man's work. You built with human ideas or you built with the word of God? I pity some of these denominational guys that used to be from real good, strong denominations. Methodism beginning with John Wesley. Presbyterianism with John Knox, John Calvin. Lutheranism with Martin Luther, Philip Melanchthon. And all of a sudden, they have gone so south. They are no more Christian than chalk is cheese in a lot of places. Not all of them. Not all of them, but a whole bunch of them. The Methodist church just dodged the bullet this last week. That's where they're going to open their church and receive and say well done to, uh, to the gay lifestyle. Doesn't matter what God says, this is what the culture says, so we better do it. Or theistic evolution. Or you name it. The challenges to the word of God. So, and that's why often, uh, never mind. In verse 14, if any man's work which he has built upon it remains because you built with the truth, he'll receive a reward. And so God will say to me, I don't care how long you preached. I don't care how well you think you preached. I want to see your notes. What did you preach? What's an ambassador have to do? Correctly represent the king that sent him. Did you teach my word? Even when they were coming for you, did you teach my word? Yes. Well done. In verse 15, if any man's work is burned up, you took Christians and you led them astray. You denied what was there. I knew of a pastor once that was teaching the book of Romans. He got to Romans 9 and then he said, turn with me to Romans 12. He just skipped the three chapters on the sovereignty of God and his return. I'd hate to have to live with that. And so in verse 16, 15, he will be saved. He was a Christian, yet as though through fire. 
How much will the fire consume? Everything. What will he have to show? Nothing. And that's why he says in verse 16, don't you know that you, plural word, the church is the temple of God. The spirit of God dwells in you. Any man who destroys the temple, meaning he built into that church error. And Christianity has been full throughout the years of guys in leadership who took the elect of God and taught them error. Do you not know if any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. His works are gone and the temple of God is holy and that is what you are. I have a sacred duty to take the elect of God that God has brought to himself and converted and then he has put them in my care. My job is to go right to this book. Amen? Because that's why you're here, is because we go to the book. And not to read it and tell you what I think, but to explain it to where exactly what it means. And if it doesn't mean it, where it might mean this, but it probably means this. And then we look at it in our lives. And on a good day, I'll try to obey it myself. All right. That's what I'm going to be judged for. It's not how big this church is. It's how deep this church goes. Is that true with you and your kids? Is that true with the people that you minister to? What are you putting into them? What are you putting into you? Let's go to a mother more pleasant text. In 2 Corinthians 5. Again to the Corinthians. In verse 9, we have as our ambition, Paul only uses the term ambition three times in the New Testament. The word phileotime means the, the love of honor. Is it good for a Christian to love honor? On a football player plays on a Friday night, on Monday they bring out the film. You know what that football player wants? He wants honor because he's going to be looked at. That's what I lived for was Monday mornings. When they intercepted the ball, did I pursue them down the sideline? <laughs> when I fumbled, did I go for the ball, all right? Or did I run off the field crying? <laughs> well, in chapter 5, verse 9, our ambition, whether at home or absent, meaning whether we're here at home or absent in glory, is to be pleasing to him. Paul said, that's my ambition. God, what did you think about what I said? God, what did you think about how I lived? What did you think? You remember the Jewish theocracy was led off by David, a man after God's heart. What does he think? In verse 10, we want to be pleasing, and he says in 10, I'll tell you why. Because we all must, the word appear is the word manifest. It means that you can see the real nature of something. I'm going to take you, and I'm going to see who you are. We must appear before the Bema so that how many of us? Each one. See, 1 Corinthians 3 was to me. This one's to us. That each one may be apodidami. Didami, to pay. Apo, to pay back. It's payback time. All that I did, I didn't receive any remuneration. It's time. And that each one may be recompensed for his deeds are literally the things through the body. I gave you 70 some odd years, I gave you 15 years. What did you do with your life? Whether according to what he has done, whether good or was it worthless? Was it phalon? Was it useless? Did you live for me? Lord, I'm a plumber, fine. Did you live for me? 
Paul writing to the Romans, each of us shall give an account to God. Paul writing to the slaves of Ephesus, uh, the good that each one has done shall be paid back from the Lord, whether slave or free. To the Philippians that sent Paul money when he's in prison, not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit that increases to your account. God knows what you did. Uh, 2 John 8, uh, beware of false teachers that you might not lose what we have accomplished, but that you'll receive a full reward. What could have been, what could have been, the most discouraging thing to me in the ministry is to see a guy who was here during the 80s and the 90s was doing fine, then I see him now, and he ain't doing zip. Damus hath loved this present world, has deserted us, and my work was for vain. You go to the end. And then 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, many run the race, one wins, you run that you can win. You're not competing against them, you're competing against you. And you run the race to win. You say no to your body. And so seven times, three parables and the Sermon on the Mount, God tells us there's going to be a reckoning. And that's what this text is in Revelation. We are in our garments white and clean. The Bema has taken place. And we are glorious. What's the wedding feast? And I conclude, the wedding feast is the party when you get married. And it's going to last for a thousand years. How would you like to pay for that? A thousand year party. Well, I conclude. Listen to this. In the Jewish mindset, this was what a marriage was. First, you chose. The father chose the bride. Were you and I chosen? Yes, we were. He chooses a bride for his son. Secondly, and incidentally, the bride had to say yes. You wouldn't force the couple. You would talk about the son, how marvelous he was. Would you have him? Yes. Sometimes I've tried to get a lot of you girls to marry my grandson. And I said to you, uh, he's mean and he's lazy, but he's real healthy. All right, I'm trying to seduce you to be part of my family. So we say yes to him. And then you had what was called the pledge or the seal, a down payment. And that will seal the fact you will be my child's bride. And then the bridegroom would go away to prepare a place and he would get the place ready where his wife would come. The girl would get as pretty as she could be because she knew the day was coming. She didn't know when and then there was the surprise coming. Behold, the bridegroom comes. And all of a sudden, she was gone. She disappeared. And he took her away to the wedding. And there at the wedding, they are together, face to face. A lot of times for the first time, they see each other. And uh, they make their vows, and he lets her know. He puts his garment over her. What's mine is yours. And then she'll march around him seven times, like Joshua did at Jericho. She has conquered him. Okay, (laughs) ain't funny. And then you know what they do? They disappear to the bridal chamber and you don't see them. They're gone. We call it the Ramada Inn. (laughs) But they leave to the bridal chamber and they emerge and everybody goes, yay! I'd rather go to the Ramada myself. But you go to the bridal chamber and you emerge and then you know what you do? The new man and the new woman go to party and you have the wedding feast and everybody is invited. Sound like us? God chose us. We said yes. Uh, He saved us. He gave us a seal, a down payment. He went to prepare a place for us and now he'll come again, receive us unto himself. And we will be with him in glory for seven years and then we will emerge at the wedding feast of the Lamb. How about that? Let's remember him in communion. Father in heaven, we stop and conclude our time this morning just in the memory of what you've done. That you came for us, you chose us, you, by the Holy Spirit, you flattered the Son 
You lifted up the beauties of the sun. You told us of his miraculous birth, of his willing death upon the cross, that you did to us what Eliezer did to Rebecca, convincing her to leave her family and go forth to the one she had never seen, to Isaac, the miraculously born child, the child who was offered up on an altar, who rose from the dead, who receives all of the Father's bounty, and you, Rebecca, you can have it. Say yes. And she said, I will go. And she left on a great journey to go back and see him. How she must have asked questions. Tell me what he's like. Tell me what he looks like. Tell me of his birth. Tell me of his death. Tell me of his resurrection. Tell me of this man. Tell me of his obedience to the Father, of his love of God. And then we see him face to face. And we are with him. And we rule with him. Thank you for your mercies. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your kindness. And Lord, we'll remember that act right now. For Christ's sake, amen.